Today, it is my honor to introduce a very special guest, Jeffrey Immelt. Jeff is chairman and CEO of GE, one of the world's largest companies. Jeff has held several global leadership positions since joining GE in 1982, including roles in GE's plastics, appliances, and healthcare businesses. In 1989, he became an officer of GE and joined the GE Capital Board in 1997. A few years later, in 2000, he was appointed President and Chief Executive Officer. Jeff has been named one of the world's best CEOs three times by Barron's. And since he began serving as CEO, GE has been named America's most admired company in a poll conducted by Fortune Magazine and one of the world's most respected companies in polls by Barron's and the Financial Times. Jeff was the chair of President Obama's Council on Jobs and Competitiveness. He's also a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving a warm NYU Stern welcome to our keynote speaker, Jeff Immelt. Good afternoon. Thank you, Peter. It's great to be here at the Garden on a day you'll always remember. My thanks to all of the NYU leadership and Stern faculty. And because of you, I'll get a chance to perform live at Madison Square Garden, <laughs> or at least as close as I'll ever get. Uh, you probably know that uh, Dean Henry just agreed to join the GE board, so that makes him my boss. Uh, it doesn't concern me in the least because I've learned how to handle uh, my superiors. Peter, is there anything you'd like before I get started here today? A pillow or a glass of water, anything at all? Uh, you know, you've earned a business degree from as fine as they come. Uh, 32 of you served in uh, the U.S. military, and thanks for that service. It's a truly, uh, truly global class with more than 60 countries. What a great chance you have to learn from each other about the world. You know, you're, you're entering a very volatile environment, the most uncertain I've ever seen. It's a world that needs better leaders with new skill sets. Uh, the playbook from the past really won't cut it. So my message for you here today is to be flexible, be bold, and don't fear criticism. And I want to discuss those lessons in the context of globalization, which will be one of the most important things that you'll traverse in your career. I built my career at a time period uh, when productivity, innovation, and globalization were essential to success, the way to win. I graduated from business school in 1982. Now those three things are reviled, particularly globalization. There were a few things I thought I knew that companies that gave people good jobs, made good products, and contributed to their communities would be valued. Governments would at least try to nurture growth and address big problems. And above all, that global integration was a force for good and would continue to grow. And in the past two decades, we've had the number of people living in poverty. The global economy has tripled in size. Income inequality at the global level has decreased. Innovation delivered better and more accessible health care, cheaper energy, and connected people across the world like never before. America was really at the center of globalization, quite consciously. American companies that invested in global operations were a source of jobs, of pride, and overseas influence. We become woven into the global economy. I joined you in 1982, 80% of our revenue was in the United States. This year, 70% of our revenue will be global. We have customers in more than 180 countries. We export more than 20 billion to the world from the United States. Our US workers earn high wages because they make leadership products that can be sold around the world. Being global has helped make us more efficient and more competitive. Today, these bonds have been fractured. Big companies are distrusted. Governments and global institutions are failing to address the world's challenges and globalization is being attacked like never before. And it's not just true in the United States, but everywhere. These are common sentiments in Europe and Latin America on both the right and the left. The future of the European Union is an open question. Protectionist barriers are rising in Asia and Africa, 
and China is repositioning its economy to be more sustainable. Many people have been left behind. The world's economy is growing too slowly. Some workers have been displaced by outsourcing. The middle class has been squeezed and in income inequality has risen to unacceptable levels. As technology and globalization race forward, people understandably fear their impact on jobs and incomes and they distrust the motives of business and government. So where does the fault lie, really? In part with business? Business is complicated. It's always important that the power of our innovation is evident, not just the constraints. Pro productivity growth has slowed to a crawl. At a time of massive liquidity and low interest rates, capital investment has declined. Financing is more difficult to get, particularly for small business and global infrastructure projects. And investment is required for productivity, and productivity is required to see higher wages. Part of the fault lies with technology. Innovation has driven growth, but also leads to greater instability. You know, the internet connects people, but it doesn't create jobs. Technology has raised competitive requirements for companies and people, and that raises economic insecurity. Part of the fault lies with government. Governments fail to promote growth in almost every corner of the world, and the U.S. regulation has expanded while infrastructure has lagged. Education has failed to keep up with modern skills. Small business creation has trailed previous times. And our politics are making impossible reform old systems. Our tax code's 30 years old, our immigration system's broken, and we have a huge structural deficit that clouds the future. Many other places are worse. While I believe in the European Union, it's tough to see Brussels really driving growth. It's added bureaucracy without the ability to solve problems. And the growth of China, has impacted global dynamics. Their focus on exports has really stoked fears in the West, and they're extremely skilled at linking between development and geopolitical influence. So while the U.S. companies are winning globally, the U.S. doesn't always engage as effectively on the global economic scene, which is 5% of the world's population and 25% of the world's GDP the U.S. has a lot to gain, but we're looking inward. Our trade deals are languishing in Congress. We remain the only developed country in the world without an export bank, and industrial exports are just not a priority in the U.S. So in the face of this headwind, we're having one hell of a presidential election, <laughs> one where every candidate, every candidate is a protectionist. Globalization is being blamed for wage inequality. There's a general sense that it's got to be somebody else's fault and improving competitiveness is not an option. And even though all of these trends hurt small businesses more than big ones, it's difficult to achieve a productive global game plan between business and government. So lesson number one, for us, flexibility and flexible thinking is required. Going forward, it's safe to say that trade deals will be very difficult without US leadership. Every country wants more jobs and are gonna seek their own advantage the anti-free tra uh, free trade sentiment isn't going to be solved by one election with one leader. So the globalization that I grew up, that I believed in, is going to change. And your world is going to look very different. So as a business leader, really, take it from me, it's difficult to decide when the old way, the way you've been taught, has to change based on what you see. So lesson two, be bold. With globalization, it's time for a bold pivot. You know, our company has $80 billion of revenue outside the United States, so globalization is critical for our success, and we're going to keep pushing forward. And in the face of a protection environment, companies are going to have to navigate the world on their own. We've got to level the playing field without government engagement. And this requires dramatic transformation, and it's going to require all of you. So let me describe how that world's going to look for you. It's going to be about localization. Sustainable growth in the future is going to require local capability inside a global footprint. We have 420 factories around the world giving us tremendous flexibility. We used to make locomotives in one factory, now we make them in five. And a localization strategy really gives you market access and can't be shut down by protectionist politics. We'll always be a strong American manufacturer 
but we also have built factories in almost every corner of the world. We've learned how to manage extended supply chains and develop small businesses. For every GE job, there's eight in the supply chain. We're not pursuing low wages. We're using manufacturing as a way to open markets. So we'll produce in the U.S. for the U.S., but our exports may decline. At the same, we'll localize production in big end-use markets like China and Saudi Arabia. And countries with effective export banks like Canada will be even more attractive for investment. The competitive advantage in the future is really about digital productivity. In the past, productivity could only be achieved through low-cost labor and large factories. In the future, manufacturing is going to be driven by new materials, digitized plants. Factories will be smaller and more flexible. Our goal is to make what we want where we want, and in that world, workers will be more productive and more valuable. Meanwhile, the digitization of assets also facilitates global productivity. The combination of the physical and the analytical are really required for infrastructure productivity. In Pakistan, we're using analytics to help make energy plants more productive. In India, we're using the internet to deliver health care in a rem uh, remote settings. In China, aircraft engine analytics are critical for airline productivity. Every industrial company in your world will also be a digital company. And this is the next wave of competitiveness. We can only accelerate growth in the new world by solving social problems. In the future, all companies are going to improve the way the world works by having local capability. And to that end, we built solutions for clean energy, healthcare access. We built local teams to del deliver solutions in markets like India and Brazil and Africa. And today, so solutions from the developing world are actually coming back to solve problems in the US and Europe. But show business can also have a unique impact on society. Two years ago, we opened a business process outsourcing center in Saudi Arabia that employs 3,000 women. Our vision was to tap into a pool of really talented Saudi women, and now they support activities in 50 countries. The center is growing and competing globally. So sometimes business can drive change faster than governments, and it's tough to hate a company that's solving climate change and creating jobs. Financing is the new oxygen of global growth. For those of you that studied finance that are graduating today, I would contend that your career is outside. While global problems create local solutions, they also create, require capital. The financing needs for infrastructure are a trillion dollars each year. One third of the world's population still lacks access to electricity. This is unacceptable when we have the technologies to solve this problem. Regulation has created a huge gap in infrastructure financing. So we're taking it on by building uh, local infrastructure finance teams capable of tapping global capital markets. These teams are critical because we really can't count on things like the US Exim Bank. One senator has blocked this despite the will of 70% of Congress. And it reinforces my point that companies need to control their own destiny globally. So we've positioned GE to capitalize on investment flows from new sources. These include the Chinese government's One Belt, One Road initiative, their attempt to develop Central Asia using infrastructure funds to do so. And unlike the US, most countries around the world are increasing their export financing. So we'll export turbines to Asia and the Middle East, made in France, supported by French financing. And lastly, to execute a bold global strategy requires simpler organizations. Complex and centralized bureaucracies are obsolete. Change requires new business models, leaner, faster, more decentralized. The days of cycling global ideas through a central headquarters, those days are over. Globalization requires pushing capability to local teams who are empowered to take risk without second guessing. We tend to think about globalization as a philosophy, but it's much more about what you do on the ground. Success requires hundreds of little things and decisions made with a local context. A good global leader has an appreciation for how people do their work in a local culture. They try to make their teams work meaningful to their country. And this allows us to hire the best talent in every country where we compete. Be flexible, be bold. By taking these actions, I'm confident we can continue to grow. Our global revenue since 2000 has grown by sixfold, and we want that to continue. I know we'll be more competitive by selling and producing 
in more countries, I also know will be more relevant by designing local solutions and building multicultural teams. But the one thing I know about globalization is that there's always going to be plenty of critics. It requires a long-term view to see the win-win. Hell, to understand globalization, you actually have to have a passport. You have no idea how many times I've been criticized in Washington for doing business around the world. Global leaders need thick skin. Early in my career, I worried way too much about what people thought about me. Over time, I realized that progress counts for more than perfection and that anything worthwhile takes persistence and resilience. Criticism made me hungrier, it made me tougher, it made me sharper. My shield consists of competency, hard work, and fairness. I don't listen to people that have no global context, never been in a factory, and don't want to compete. I run a meritocracy with the highest standards. Everyone who joins GE, Americans, Mexicans, Chinese, Nigerians, men and women, Muslims and Christians, straight and gay, know they have a future if they perform. Discrimina discrimination has no place in business in the United States or any place in the world. Similarly, our factory teams know that while we can't guarantee markets, we can't guarantee effort. We always play to win. And these are American values. These values resonate globally. And by adopting this approach, we've become a better global company. So be flexible, be bold, don't fear criticism. We're going through a transformational change in globalization, which will require fresh new thinking. And I hope you join me. I'm proud of my profession. Our goal is to build an economic ecosystem that's the most competitive in the world, to create great jobs through private enterprise and ingenuity, to give back competency and innovation directed at solving the world's toughest problems. There's nothing elitist or establishment about this task. Giving speeches about jobs doesn't create jobs. Only by being in the arena can you create work for others. And whether you're going to a startup or a company on Wall Street, your work matters in a vibrant economy. The discord we see in the US today and around the world is primarily due to slow growth and the wealth discrepancy it creates. This problem won't be solved by any bureaucracy. It requires new leaders who see the world as it is and are willing to drive change. You know, two weeks ago, I gave the commitment speech at Clemson. I tell seniors in college not to be too bummed out. They can still party a bit and their jobs won't be too hard. For MBA students like you, there is no comf comfort. It's, <laughs> it's time to go to work. <laughs> It's time to pay off your loans. Uh, we need you now. There's some amazing days ahead. Thank you very much and good luck.